Well, I left school around the age of 15, feeling free and very optimistic. The next 18 months or so were spent very happily on the river, from Woodhall Park to Waterford Marsh, as well as my home beat. My father and father-in-law, Sammy Neal, had leased the, these three miles of beautiful chalk stream in 1935 and formed a small syndicate of 12 rods, mainly doctors and specialists. Uh, three of these were fairly eminent. Sir Girling Ball, who was then Dean of St. Bartholomew's, Dr. John Elam, who pioneered, pioneered the gas and oxygen machine, Mr. McGill, who was then, was then a, a leading anaesthetist, and there were various others, many of whom I taught to cast and how to stalk and catch our wily brown trout. They rewarded, rewarded me greatly with their conversation and enthusiasm, and I might say quite a lot of repairable fishing tackle. I had become a, an unofficial and almost unpaid river keeper. I spent all my waking hours on weed cutting, bank trimming, style mending and verming control. Enormous satisfaction and sense of achievement derived from river work can only be appreciated by those who have had the privilege of such experience. The biggest problem with vermin control was keeping the herons off the spawning beds in the spring when so many large and gravid wild brown trout were speared by them and left to float away either dead or dreadfully injured. I collected many of these unfortunate big fish and artificially expressed and fertilised their eggs on the spot. Uh, these eggs were then deposited into existing natural gravel nests to ensure that they stayed put and were not swept away by the current. I invented a funnel-headed tube which I pressed down into the gravel and poured the eggs in with a jug. In the end, uh, I could not defend the many spawning reds up and down the river uh, so this rather pointless carnage of big parent fish, which were far too big for the herons to eat, must have contributed greatly to the serious decline in the brown, native brown trout populations during the 1930s and 40s. Another serious act of official vandalism uh, which compounded this loss was the installation of headwater pumping stations, which very quickly severely lowered the headwater levels destroying a large percentage of natural spawning habitat. I recall discussing this beaching-like vandalism with a member of the then Metropolitan Water Board, uh, Mr. Hessel Hazeltine. Uh, he said that uh, if it was a question of fishing or flushing our toilets, then the toilets must win. Uh, this uh, lethal abstraction should have been at the lower levels of our rivers which would have conserved their ecological welfare. This discussion was 60 years ago, and look at our water supply and river health situation today. The drainage of our water meadows and wetlands for agricultural purposes has been yet another act of gross vandalism, as these were the vital natural sponges that sustained our natural water levels and health throughout the summer and dry periods. Unless these areas are reinstated and headwater abstraction totally stopped, there's no hope of ecological recovery. During the 1930s, we noted the serious decline uh, in our natural brown trout populations. And like uh, so many other syndicates, we were compelled to introduce imported rainbow trout to give our fishermen something worthwhile to fish for. Uh, they had a much faster growth rate than artificially reared brown trout and therefore very much cheaper to produce. Our first consignment of rainbow came from the Berkshire Trout Farm and it was soon evident that uh, they had several very unfortunate characteristics. The natural reproduction in our chalk streams was really unsatisfactory. Uh, they were, as were their migratory and shoaling behaviour possible to find them many miles downstream from their original stocking point within a few days of introduction, and gone altogether by the end of the season. This necessitated expensive interim restocking. They also lacked the cunning and stability of the native brown trout, which preferred to spread itself evenly and stay in the same chosen spot for long periods, sometimes for years. 
and there was nothing suicidal or easy about them. Yeah, you needed a degree of skill, effort, observation and patience which you will rarely see today. I was now 17 years old and had started to give serious consideration to a career in the outside world. I was being asked rather often about my future by some of my acquaintances. Among these was a delightful man, Sir Hugh Loveday Beasley, who frequently walked up the river to, to commune with nature and rest his soul, as he so poignantly put it. He was the common sergeant at the Old Bailey, a quietly spoken man with an air of pensive regret, a senior judge who tried most of the heavy crime during the 1930s. We sometimes sat and talked for long periods, and I occasionally fished with him at his home lower down the River Bean. I still have a letter he sent me from the Central Criminal Court with a signed pass authorising my admission at any time. Sadly, he died whilst I was in Africa during the 1970s. Uh, there was another kindly acquaintance who finally launched me into the outside world. His name was Mr. Field, a director and general manager of the Car Mart Company in Euston Road. He was a frequent fishing guest of my father-in-law, Sammy Neal. He approached me on the river bank and told me that a friend of his, Captain T.L. Edwards, who was a, an international tournament casting champion, was looking for an under-21 to join the Hardy Brothers team as an amateur. In a few days I had an appointment to meet him at his flat in North London. From here we proceeded to the Welsh Harp at uh, Lake at Hendon, where he had a casting platform from which he apparently gave demonstrations and lessons. He produced a number of very beautiful hardy rods and reels with matching lines and it was some of the loveliest equipment that I'd ever seen. Well, he put me through my paces and he seemed well pleased with the result and having made various suggestions about my technique, he finally dropped me off at Golders Green Station with some of this marvellous fishing tackle with instructions to practice regularly and to come back in a month's time. Well, I eventually received written confirmation that I'd been accepted and that he proposed to train me for, at once for the forthcoming tournaments in Brussels and Paris. I later saw Mr. Field and his re relayed comments boosted my ego sky high. I was on my way. It all seemed so simple and alluring. But disaster was just around the corner. Thinking I was doing the right thing, I answered an advertisement in the Daily Telegraph and Morning Post for an assistant to the fishing tackle department of Messrs. Cogswell and Harrison, 168 Piccadilly, London W1. I was interviewed by Mr. Peskett and asked to start the following Monday. When I told Captain Edwards of my enterprise and good fortune, I was devastated to be told that they were competitors of Hardy Brothers, and that made me professional that there was no such thing as a professional amateur, etc. He shortly confirmed this by letter, and I returned the marvellous equipment by Mr. Field, who was very sympathetic and understanding. Well, this was my first introduction to the complications and realities of the outside world. I continued with Cogswell and Harrison for some months and enjoyed meeting all sorts of fishermen, mostly in bowler hats with rolled umbrellas, and listening to the worldwide experiences and storing away all sorts of mental intentions for the future, like Marcia in India, Nile Perch in Africa. But of course, fate determines the future. War was on the horizon, and the daily press began to fill with enticing and exciting advertisements for training pilots, freedom of the skies, and so on. Well, an old friend and companion, Dennis Russell Pavia, came to see me at Beanside and suggested that we both applied for commissions in the Royal Air Force rather than wait for compulsory call-up for general military service. We were both pretty fit and uh, sent in our forms of application to the Air Ministry. In due course we were called to attend for interview and medicals. Uh, they were very thorough and the whole thing lasted for about three days. Uh, in the end, uh, the result was that I passed, but sadly Dennis failed uh, due to colour blindness of all things. 
there it was. The die was cast, and Hitler's armies were on the move. I soon received orders from the Air Ministry to report for elementary flying training to White Wolf near Maidenhead. I was sorry to hand in my notice to Cogswell and Harrison, for I'd learned quite a, a lot about people and the world in general, and uh, I very much enjoyed the experience. I was given a brief complimentary reference and good wishes for my future, I went on my way. Uh, the day before I was scheduled to leave for White Waltham, I took a last walk down the garden that had seemed so vast and unexplored to me in my short grey pants all those years ago. I didn't look forward to saying goodbye to dear old Kathleen. I stopped and spoke to the two dogs in their pen halfway down the drive, and then on to Kathleen, who was working on his asparagus beds. I said I was on my way for flying training and wanted to say goodbye, or well, I was totally unprepared for his reaction. Poor old boy had tears streaming down his weather-beaten face and holding my hand in both of his said, Please go, Mr. Verney. You go. I feel so bad. Well, I never saw Captain again. I shall never forget him or know anyone more worthy than him. A goodbye really depressed me, and I was glad to see Dennis early next morning when he came to see me off and carry my luggage down to Harford North Station. We finally shook hands and waved a nonchalant farewell. Dennis eventually joined the army, he rose to the rank of major, but died serving in Africa, so I never saw him again. I arrived at Maidenhead around midday and walked the five miles to Altmore Cherry Garden Lane where pupil pilots were billeted. This house was just a few minutes from White Waltham Aerodrome. I arrived tired and hungry. Uh, there were already about 15 inmates, mostly Canadians, with a sprinkling of South Africans, Australians and a few Englishmen. All were full of life and humour, extremely friendly and seemed to have money to burn. I had no sooner been shown my allocated bunk than a lot of us piled into a variety of cars ranging from Ford V8 pilots to Morris 8s. We were racing back down a very dusty Cherry Garden Lane heading for lunch at Skindles Hotel in Maidenhead and something I knew very little about called alcohol. I vaguely remembered lunch, but very little more, until I was awakened for supper at Cherry Garden Lane around 6 p.m. My only consolation was that there were two other similar casualties. It was a strange atmosphere of immediate solution and humorous indifference to all problems and embarrassing generosity. I still remember some of the names, Hardy de Forest, Lander Linden, Doug Hayward, Charles Green and many others. I also remember those names which gradually appeared in the casualty lists as time moved on. I sometimes wish we were living in a kinder world. The following morning we all reported to the aerodrome, the complete formalities such as next of kin, blood group, religion, official secrets act rules and regulations, flying and lecture programs, etc. That evening, and for the rest of the course, a rather more sober and restrained atmosphere prevailed. A serious flying instruction started a few days later, and I was lucky to be allocated a very cheerful and thorough instructor, Flying Officer Ray, who sent me solo after ten and a half hours of patient dual instruction. This was a, gr a great thrill and a sense of achievement. A few weeks later we were split up and sent to various advanced training schools with our first assessments entered in our new flying logbooks. You could be graded average, above average or exceptional. I think that everybody got average ratings.